Good morning. I know that we've been having a lot of issues with Blackboard, and I'm very, very sorry about that. But I do not want you guys to miss this unit information. You need it when you take your test. Make sure that you complete the Unit 1 study guide. It will help you on the test. You can use it when you take the test, and it's also worth extra credit. So it's really to your benefit to fill it out and use it. I'm going to just go through some review information. As usual, our mission statement is here. The mission of the Michigan Virtual Charter Academy is to provide an innovative, intensive academic preparation that inspires and educates students to achieve the highest levels of academic knowledge and skills. Michigan Virtual Charter Academy embraces a collaborative partnership between teachers and parents in order to empower students to reach extraordinary heights. Extraordinary results require extraordinary efforts. Through commitment, hard work, consistency, and responsibility, every student will meet the challenge of mastering high expectations. If you are unaware, I did discuss this at least in the AM section a couple of days ago when Blackboard was working briefly. In the coming weeks, I'm going to be reaching out to random students and asking them to present a little bit about themselves at the beginning of some of our lessons. I want us to get the chance to get to know each other, to really build a class community. I know that it would be nice for all of you to know who your classmates are and just learn a little bit more about them. If I contact you, it is not a requirement. You can decide that you do not want to do it. You don't have to do it. Just let me know that you'd prefer not to. It will not bother me at all. I completely understand. But if you decide that you would like to, and I've reached out to you, if you could just put together a PowerPoint slide like this with pictures, information, talk about your hobbies, your interests, your family, your friends, whatever you want to share. If you can't put together a PowerPoint slide, you can send me pictures via K-Mail and give me some information so that I can build one for you. And I'd really like it if you could get on the mic and present, but if you don't have a microphone, that's okay. Just let me know, and you'll be able to do some talking in the chat box, and I will present the information for you. So just keep a lookout for that key mail. Let's do some review. We had a lot of struggle with the checkpoint, or with the exit slip that we had the other day. Zoroastrianism is the religion of the Persian royalty. It's still practiced by a few today. So make sure that you know that and you have the proper definition for it. Which of the following is not an example of a primary source? Remember, primary source means it's coming directly from the person. So if you're reviewing an oral record, that means maybe you're listening to a speech. That's a primary source because it is directly from the person. The person is speaking. You are listening to that primary source. Written laws are a primary source because they give us a glimpse into what was happening at that time and they're written down that is the exact law that was put into place and being utilized. It's not coming second hand. My diary is also an example of a primary source. If you're reading my diary or anyone's diary, you're reading a primary source. It's directly from that person. They're choosing to write it down and put it in a format where it can be read by generally themselves, but eventually by others. So it's a primary source. An editorial is not a primary source. An editorial you generally find in a newspaper, and that is someone's take on an event, an issue, an action item, what have you. It's someone's opinion. It is not a primary source because it is not factual information coming directly from the person, the, the source, about that particular event, issue, etc. It is someone's opinion on that. So make sure that you look at that doc, that presentation we did where we went over primary and secondary sources and take a look at those differences there and get yourself familiar because you are going to have to know that information. We are going to be utilizing primary sources in our coming lessons. This is just some key vocab. I'm not going to go through it with you. There are four slides filled with key vocabulary. Some of it is on your unit study guide. If you're choosing to fill that out, I strongly suggest you write in those definitions. You are more than welcome to save these slides as well. You could do a screenshot and fill them in. These key words you will see coming up in our unit test. Just a couple of them to note. The Lascaux, we did 
we went through a little online activity where we watched a presentation of the Lascaux Cave in which there were early paintings and drawings done by the hunter-gatherers that lived in that area. We saw a lot of pictograms of animals, a lot of indication that animals were very important to them at the time. There were bulls, there were cows, there were buffalo. Okay, you need to know where the Euphrates is. You also need to know that where summer is located, that's one of the civilizations we talked about, and Sumerians were the people of that civilization. You also need to be able to locate the Tigris River. Okay, cuneiform, an early writing system, we talked about it in depth. Theocracy, that is when the government is controlled by one particular person, a ruler, and that ruler believes to have gained his power by God, through God, from God. God has given them power. We talked about Anubis, Isis, and Osiris, as well as Ra, so you need to make sure that you look up who those were and know which, what God they were for. Hieroglyphics was the Egyptian writing system, and papyrus is what the Egyptians invented to be able to keep records. They wrote hieroglyphics on papyrus. Sinai, you need to know where that is. You need to know where the Ganges River is, the Gobi Desert, the Huanghe, the Yangtze. Those are all locations on a map, as well as where Mohanjo-Daro was. Remember, that's an excavation site we talked about. More there are further people on this slide that you want to get familiar with. We talked about Darius and Medes and Nebuchadnezzar. We just talked at the beginning here about Zoroastrianism. Okay, history and why do we study it? You're going to be asked this question, and this was information that was given in our very first ever lesson in the course. We talked about history. What is history? History shows us what it means to be human. It improves our judgment because we're able to look at past events and determine the pros and cons of what occurred so that we hopefully don't make the same mistakes again. It provides us constructive examples. Maybe we need information about how something might occur if we do X, Y, Z. It's probably happened before, and we can take a look at the outcome and make adjustments and educated guesses on what needs to happen differently. It makes us better thinkers. It supports a common cultural understanding and dialogue. We learn about other cultures. We develop an understanding of other cultures so that we don't just have empathy or sympathy for them, but we fully under we try to fully understand how they exist, what their traditions are, and how we can coexist. It satisfies a need for identity for both individuals and nations. We know where we came from, how we got here, how our nation was built, how other nations were built. It helps us identify who we are. And for some, it gives us pleasure to study history, to learn about other cultures and events, myself including. So let's test our knowledge a little bit. Humans originated on what continent? We talked about this in length. The first, or I should say the oldest human remains were found on the continent of Africa. We believe that human civilization started in that area that we refer to as the Fertile Crescent. But there was some civilization that had to have de begun to develop in Africa, and that is where we find the oldest human remains. Improved farming techniques resulted in what? Remember, they were able to start building plows. They were starting to irrigate their farms. They were settling down. They were no longer moving and migrating with the animals. Instead, they're starting to farm. They improved farming through the use of plows and irrigation and other tools that they made out of bronze. This leads to a food surplus because they're able to grow more than they need because they're doing so well with farming. And food surplus leads to trade because they can use that extra food to trade for other goods, to trade for bronze, other types of metal, jewelry, whatever they might need at the time, they can trade with other civilizations. And trade ultimately leads to, leads to everything else because there's an influx of information. They're able to exchange ideas, knowledge, innovations, improve language. All of this happens through trade. So originally, it's that food surplus. These improved farming techniques lead to the food surplus, which allows them to trade. 
What are the characteristics of a civilization? We talked about them. We talked about them in depth. There are five of them. Trade and economy, government, social organization, writing, and innovations and technology. So trade and economy are one, innovations and technology are one, and then we have government, social organization, and writing. Those are the five characteristics of a civilization. Not only have we talked about it in depth, but you've been tested on it, and it was also part of your, it was also the main component of your 1.9 writing assignment. So I really hope you know those five by now. Locations. Let's look at four main areas we need to know. We've talked about four civilizations, and again, those have been drilled into you hopefully by now. India, Egypt, China, and summer. Okay. Number one on our map here, it's Egypt. It's located not only in modern day Egypt, but also the early Egyptian civilization right there along the Nile and to the north with the Mediterranean. Okay, number two is China, modern day China, but also original Chinese civilization. Three is where we find summer or Mesopotamia, same, same thing as summer was an advancement from the Mesopotamian culture. And then four is India, or the Indus River Valley civilization. Which groups migrated from Russia to modern day Turkey? We did not discuss this. You learned this in one of your lessons and within your readings. The Hittites and the Aryans are the ones. They migrated south from what would be a colder region of modern day Russia into Turkey in the Middle East. What was the first code of laws named? You guys did an online activity about this. It was Hammurabi's code, the code of Hammurabi. This was the first recorded system of laws that we have. Name two accomplishments of the Chaldeans. We actually talked about a lot of them, but there are two that really stand out because they're considered ancient wonders of the world. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon, Remember, you need to know where Babylon is located, the, and the Ishtar Gate. But they also had a strong knowledge of astronomy and medicine. They tracked the movement of the stars, and this really helped them to understand our universe, but also to develop their calendar and timing systems. They really had a strong understanding of medicine and medicinal practices. They used plants. They created chemicals, things that they could use to help aid those who were sick and ailing. We have four civilizations. We have Egypt, Summer, China, and India. I want you to take a look at these questions we have up on the board and match them up with the appropriate civilization. Which civilization built pyramids and mummified their leaders? Hopefully you guys know this. We know that they mummified pharaohs, and that would be the Egyptian civilization. When we think of Egypt, we think of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Sphinx, all of that. Which civilization had home and family at the center of their life? That's China. Remember we talked about how important the family was to them, how they worshipped their ancestors, they focused on home life, the men were expected to be stern disciplinarians, and the women were expected to work in the home. Ziggurats, those are those stepped type temples leading up they're in the shape of a pyramid, but instead of having straight sides, they have steps, big giant steps that lead to the smaller portion at the top. These are called ziggurats, and they were a, an aspect of the Sumerian civilization or Mesopotamia, same thing, okay? And they used cuneiform, which is an early writing system using pictograms for record keeping. Which new kingdom pharaoh demanded his people practice a new monotheistic religion? Remember, polytheism is the practice of multiple gods. Monotheism means you have only one god. And this is the new kingdom within Egypt. Okay, we know this because it's a pharaoh. And he required that they don't that they don't worship multiple gods. Instead, his people would worship only one god, and that would be Amenhotep. He is also known as Akhenaten. I couldn't even pronounce that correctly if I tried, but you definitely have him on your study guide as well as in some of our previous lessons we talked about him. 
Lastly, I want you to be able to name two accomplishments of the Persian Empire. So we named two of the Chaldeans. Now we want to discuss two that deal with the Persian Empire. The Persians used govern, governors and infrastructure to maintain control. They also created the world's first real postal service. They're transmitting information across their entire empire, and that's a huge empire. If we look at it on a map, it's a massive stretch of geography. As the Persian Empire began to grow, it took up the Middle East, parts of Africa, Europe. It is a humongous section of our world. They were the largest empire at the time. And they also protected temples in places they conquered, so they didn't, re they didn't tear them down, they didn't destroy other civilizations. They tried to protect that and preserve it for future generations. If you have questions, please send them to me in a K-mail, that way I can help you with them since we aren't able to do a live lesson. Thank you very much for attending. And I'm going to go to the next slide. You're going to have your exit survey. I need you to fill out the exit survey. That lets me know that you watched through the presentation and you understand the information. And it will give you the participation points that you would have otherwise missed since we couldn't hold the lesson. You can copy and paste or try and click right on the link here. You'll see it's a Google Doc link down at the bottom. Go ahead and select that or copy and paste it into your web browser and you'll be able to complete the survey. Thank you very much and you guys have a great day.